Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I was going to introduce uh, myself uh, with an avatar just to give you an idea of how this could be done, uh, both for students and teachers. Uh, but there's a summary of what the uh, avatar will say. I'll just start it a little bit just to get an idea what you can do in your classes. Dr. Nellie Deutsch is an experienced educator, well known for her involvement in online learning and teaching. She's particularly interested in blending technology with face-to-face -face instruction. She has been teaching English as a foreign language in high school and at the university level, and has been involved in teacher training for a number of years. She applies a unique peer learning approach. In her teaching, Okay, I'm going to stop. I think you got the idea. Uh, let me continue uh, with asking you a question. Where do you get your information? If you could add that in the chat, or maybe you want to uh, use your voice. Where do you get your information? And I mean about anything, not just school related, university related, but information in general. So let me check the chat. Journal articles, life, you give your, I love that, your information. Thank you, Sam, up from life. All right, that's true. That's very true. We get our information actually from anywhere. But when you want on a specific subject um, and you, you can't wait around for life to bring it to you or to experience it, which I totally agree with you, um, where would you get it? Okay, that's what I mean. I should have been clearer on that. Google, okay, thank you. Uh, Johnny says, Bart, okay, great. The internet, basically, that's it. All right, so that's, um, that's what I wanted to hear, where you get your information, because AI is just about that. All right, so these are um, the presentation slides. And if you've got a phone, uh, and I'm sure everybody has a phone nearby, if not in front of them, on the side, somewhere, uh, there's the QR code for the slides, but I'm sure, Evelyn, you will also share the slides in case uh, someone can't get it. But if you'd like to look at it as we go, that's an idea. There are lots of slides. There are about 115 exactly um, slides that I'm not going to go through all of them, but I encourage you to look at them. You can view them. You can copy the slides. That's fine. You can download them and you can share them. It's uh, it's fine with me, no permission required. This is an overview of what we're gonna be talking about. We'll be talking about what, why, and how. Uh, so what are the recommend, what do we recommend to, uh, to students? Uh, why and how, I'll be going through that and then I'll be going through some of my personal experiences. Why, to help you save time. And then I'm going to go through a comparison of some AI tools, artificial intelligence and um, innovation, how to integrate in the higher education classroom and the why I expect you to fill in. So why would you do this in your classes, in your courses? Why would you add artificial intelligence? as a way for your students to learn. Now, if you don't know why today, uh, you might wanna search and find out why for yourself because knowing why will help you uh, decide whether you wanna use it or not. And then AI tools for higher education and the why is of course that they enhance learning uh, and engagement, comparison of AI tools, prompt engineering, the why, um, I'm going to go through prompt engineering is because they provide ease of use, accuracy, and speed. We don't want to waste time um, looking for prompts or trying out prompts and not getting the results that we want. And we'll take a look at some free resources, research, ethical considerations is required. And finally, we'll take a look at uh, a plan, how to implement a uh, university-wide plan and individual instructor plan. Uh, these are the tools that I recommend to my students. I teach at a university in Greece, uh, fully online at a distance because I'm not in Greece. 
And I recommend AI tools to my students. I teach immersive technologies. I recommend ChatGPT4. I know it's really, really expensive, but we'll talk about later on about ChatGPT3 and why it's actually useless. Not, not really, it doesn't really have much to offer. And there's the why and how to use it. Uh, you can read that later on. Google Bard uh, just got Gemini, uh, which is an enhancement to Google Bard. If you're not using Google Bard, you might want to try it. I'll provide reasons why and what it does later on. And then there's Claude. I don't know if you've heard of Claude. Uh, notice that all the screen is clickable. So if you have the PowerPoint, you'll be able to click on these and go into it. The why and the how to use it. Um, Claude, I'll be comparing them later on, but Claude is uh, a bit different from Google Bard and ChatGPT. I'll be going into the differences. And then there is Bing Chat, which is a Microsoft AI, but notice just the chat, not Bing in general, but the chat. Uh, now ChatGPT, is actually uh, using Bing that's embedded in Bing and we'll go through that as well. I also recommend Illicit for research articles. Uh, they can get articles completely free that are accessible. Of course, the ones that are open access and Cite. Uh, Cite uh, has a free version, which isn't that great. So I prefer Illicit and I'll be going into that also later on. There's also Semantic Scholar. The free version is amazing. You'll be able to take a look at that. And Consensus. If you haven't heard of any of these, you'll have a chance to uh, check them out, try them out. Because um, Generative AI, and we'll be talking about that, is just that. It's a chat a chance to uh, get information by using a chat box. And then there's Kineas. I also recommend uh, Kineas. Um, it is also completely free and enables students to access articles, to upload articles, and to get information from the articles. I also recommend Grammarly to my students. They now have an amazing AI writing assistant that checks for grammar and style improvements. It's not to ask my students to copy and paste. It's to ask my students to try out these tools to assist them, and not to uh, replace them. And that's what these AIs do also do for us. They're not going to replace us, they're going to assist us. And if we know more about them, we'll be able to assist our students and guide them on what to use. So the minute my students, um, you know, find out that, oh, Nelly's recommending all these AI tools, that's great. And, and then they, they don't bother to copy and paste because they know that I know all about them. And uh, in fact, I probably know more than they do. I usually do. So the more we know, the better we are equipped to help our students and avoid plagiarism. When we talk about plagiarism, um, later on. And then there's Quillbot. Uh, it's also a Chrome extension that is always there to help you and your students. This is not only for students. So those are the recommendations. Uh, these are the tools that I use on a regular basis. Every single day, <laughs> I spend a lot of time on that. And these are my personal use of generative AI. And we'll talk about the differences between generative and artificial intelligence. So I use ChatGPT4. I use Google Bard, Illicit, Kiddius, and Transcriptor. Now, Transcriptor is great because uh, my students uh, have to create a lot of videos. That's how they base um, their learning because it's at a distance. And I transcribe. So Transcriptor really helps me um, transcribe and, sorry, oh, I went too fast, and um, provide feedback for my students. Uh, these are my uh, personal reflections on generative AI. Uh, the tool 
ChatGPT 3.5 is great for text chatting, but that's about it. It's not accurate. It hallucinates. And it doesn't give you real information, doesn't give you tables. And I love tables, as you will see in this presentation. Uh, it doesn't offer any links or images. So, you know, what does it do? Not really much. And then there's Chad GPT-4. It is expensive. And I wish it weren't. And I wish universities would offer it to us for free. Maybe you can get your university to uh, offer it for free because it's the best thing <laughs> Um, except for Google Bard, that's, they're competing. Google Bard with Gemini is getting, it's getting there and they're competing, which is a good thing for us because we're getting a really good product. So ChatGPT4 uses Bing, the internet. So you can uh, add links and get information about different websites. It has DALI -E images, personal builder profile. So you can build and I'll show you what I built. You don't need any coding to build your own uh, GPTs. It generates images. I said it also provides links to research articles and it doesn't hallucinate uh, except for images and tables. Uh, what's negative for me about Chad GPT-4 are the images because uh, I keep having to add prompts. And even when I add prompts and I, for example, tell Chad GPT, I don't want a black background. I don't want any black on my images, it says, okay, here's an image without black. And guess what? Black is there. So it seems that uh, ChatGPT will decide what it wants when it comes to images. Even though you get great images, um, it's hard to get it to remove certain things like uh, the black or the shadows. Uh, Google Bard is very current, just like ChatGPT4. Uh, it has links, it has about sites, and you can now, with Gemini, you can add YouTube videos, and it transcribes and um, summarizes the YouTube videos. And you have to keep that in mind, because your students will be doing that. So um, it's a way you'll have to ask them, as uh, I think Evelyn mentioned, interactive questions about the videos that they might not get in the summary. And it also summarizes websites, but there's no image generator. You can upload an image, but there's no generator. And I'll be going into comparisons later on. Uh, these are some comparisons. I'm not gonna go through it. You can see it uh, with ChatGPT as opposed to ChatGPT4 with Bing, Bard with Gemini. By the way, Gemini was just added in December, a couple of days ago. Uh, there's Bing by itself, Bing Chat, and Claude. And you can see the different aspects and how they uh, differ and compare them. So uh, let's go into some definitions. What is artificial intelligence and andragogical innovation? So there's an image created by, of course, ChatGPT4. So artificial intelligence, just so you know, because everybody's writing artificial intelligence, but actually they don't mean that. So we'll look at the differences between artificial intelligence and generative AI. So you can read what that is and you know what androgyny is. And now AI for adult learners. There's a wonderful article that just came out by Darvishi et al. Uh, it came out now, December, on um, how AI tools are used, uh, how students are using AI tools. And I mean AI, when I say AI tools, I mean generative AI tools, and how it has been influencing uh, not only their database and what they're learning, but other aspects of their lives. Uh, so what is the difference between AI and generative AI? Any ideas? If you know, you can raise your hand or your virtual hand. We're going to take a look at these. Or you can, if you've got the PowerPoint open, you can take a look at that. So just to give you an idea, the left is 
artificial intelligence and the right is generative um, artificial intelligence. So the difference is that artificial intelligence by itself is very, very mechanical and generative is creative, creative text as well as uh, images, art and music as well, music, poetry, literature, everything that's connected to uh, art and creativity. So the definition of AI as opposed to generative AI, you can see that AI includes computer system which performs tasks and it repeats the tasks over and over and over again. And that's really important because generative AI does not repeat Whatever you write, <laughs> and I'm sure that you're nodding your head, some of you, if you've tried this, you'll know that every time you write a prompt or uh, you want some information and you write it, this, you'll always get different things. The writing will be slightly different. The images will be completely different. It's never going to be the same. And that's the creative creativity part of it, if you like. It's always different. Where artificial intelligence just repeating the same thing over and over again. So our students are not going to become robots when they use generative AI because it's creative. And the scope, you can see the scope of uh, artificial intelligence versus uh, generative AI. I'm going to go on to applications, examples, and primary functionality. And you can see that with generative AI, You've got images, text generators, image generators, music uh, generation software, and so on. That's all generative AI. Creative AI is another way of looking at it. And you can see that the artificial intelligence is very, very technical with no creativity. So you can think of it as the right brain, the left brain. The left brain is um, artificial intelligence. The right is generative AI. So. A lot of people are discussing prompt engineering. So we're gonna look at uh, prompt engineering for images, and you can also take courses for free, and I'll be showing you some of that. So uh, prompt engineering for generative AI. We can get realistic scenes. If you write as a prompt, realistic scene, you'll get not cartoon-like images, but you'll get real, real-looking images. They're not going to be 100%. They'll be beautiful if you want them to be beautiful um, or not if you want them to be looking like something else. But you'll be able to add the setting. What is the setting? Morning, noon, afternoon, a uh, scene at a school. Set the setting, the time of day, the lighting, main subjects, objects, and moods. So you need to give uh, the generative AI to lots of information that's really, really important. And then you'll get, here's an example. If you copy this, um, I think I jumped. If you copy, for example, and you'll be able to do this with the PowerPoint, copy this prompt. Whatever you get will be completely different from what I get. And if I do it again, I'll get something else. So it's really amazing how um, creative generative art uh, AI really is. And then uh, if you write abstract, if you want the image to be abstract, or you want it to go to uh, resemble a genre, uh, an artistic genre, or you want a concept, uh, you'll get different things. So I suggest you try these prompts on your own when you have time later on and, and see what you get. And portraits, you can ask for portraits or characters from movies, characters from books. If you're teaching literature, uh, this is a chance for students. Uh, I'm not talking about teachers here. I'm talking about students uh, to come up with different portraits and you can compare them in class. Oh, and, and they can explain. If it's fully online, then they explain uh, by text or audio if, they, if you like. But if they're in the classroom, they can discuss you know, so there's lots of learning and discussions uh, going on. We're going to continue with text, prompt engineering for text. Uh, the types are descriptive prompts, creative writing prompts, and I'm sure you've seen them 
informative prompts, research-based prompts, and uh, you can see the key elements and example prompts, uh, depending on your field, whatever you're teaching, or for students, whatever they're learning, and their instructional prompts. Now, I've been using instructional prompts, and they really save me a lot of time. Because uh, if I had to take all the information and come up with instructions, it would take me much longer. So I add whatever I need and, and the generative AI comes up with instructions that are wonderful. Sometimes I use them and sometimes I don't, but you know, you, you can try them out and see, for example, outline the process for something or uh, whatever you're asking your students because we, we are constantly adding instructions especially on with online courses. That's what I do most of the time. Uh, spend time on instructional prompts and conversational prompts, persuasive prompts. Uh, you can have different tones, ask for different tones. You can ask um, the generative AI tool to come up with, you know, a professor or a researcher's tone of voice. Uh, and it's really hilarious sometimes to see what they come up with. And these can be compared in the classroom. Uh, with your students so that uh, everybody knows that everybody's using AI anyways. So let's um, learn together. Question answer prompts, emotive prompts, reflective prompts, all these are available. And you can take a look at some of these examples and key elements later on. Also educational scenario prompts that are important, student engagement prompts to get them to engage, rubrics uh, prompts and rubrics in general um, can be created with uh, Chad GPT, for example, or Google Bard. Course outline. All my courses, um, I'm not saying that it's all Chad GPT or Google Bard, but I, I base a lot of um, my uh, work, my course outline using these uh, AI tools and it makes life a, a lot. I mean, it just makes things faster. It's just um, a fast way of doing things. And I like to do things quickly because uh, you need time for yourself. And we'll be talking about time for yourself later on. So why spend hours, you know, on your course outline or your syllabus when um, you can get help? And then there's grading criteria, as I mentioned before, uh, with that. So how can AI, generative AI, we're talking here, uh, enhance learning for adult learners. Now, they're not going to be walking in the classroom. So, you know, it's not like they're going to take over. They're only going to help. And uh, I think, Evelyn, you mentioned that when somebody brought a, uh, a robot into the classroom, I'm sure it wasn't full size. It was probably some little thing that walked around. All right, so what aspect... Uh, do we want? We want personalized learning. That's what we want our students to have. We want to reach each and every one of them. And how can we possibly do it when we have hundreds of students uh, in one class? So with AI, you can come up with, or the AI with your help, uh, can come up with personalized learning for your students, whether in groups or whether individually. Uh, the same material done in different ways to cater to their needs. Um, intelligent tutoring systems, you can provide them with extra work uh, to cater to their needs. Really, really easy with um, these generative AIs, as well as automated grading and feedback. So getting help fast. You provide the information and the outcome is what the generative AI will come up with. I think I skipped here. And if you wanna know what's going on in your classroom, how are you going to analyze the information? You can analyze it on your own. You don't have to pay a lot of money. There are a lot of free data-driven AI tools that you can use. I'll be mentioning some of them. But these are some of the aspects of how these AI tools can help you. I'm sure you're not interested in virtual and augmented reality, but that's what I teach, so I added that. Uh, you can also get chatbots and virtual assistants. Uh, these can be done through ChatGPT, 
very easily without coding, by the way, but only with the, um, the paid version, with the subscription. And as I mentioned before, we want our content to be taped to each one of, my, of our students. And the way to do that is to customize content. And it can be done. It's not one person creating it. It's you and the AI. And the AI has a lot of information. It's really fast. All you have to do is feed it, and it'll come up with um, content for each and every one of your students, in fact. It's, it's so quick. And of course, you want predictive ana analytics. You want to know how your students are going to be doing if right now they're doing X and, uh, and you're not sure whether that's enough. Will they pass? Are they learning? Are they not learning? You can check these out with predictive analytics and you can also um, help students uh, process large data sets. You can help them with that. And of course, there are collaboration tools, language translations, which are really, really important uh, with the international, with the migrations and international uh, students. <clears throat> and of course, uh, ethical and critical thinking in education through deciding what. So uh, what tools? We're going to look at some of these tools uh, very quickly because... Uh, I want to leave some time for questions. Now, notice what I have here. AI tools, the benefits for students, student tools, benefits for teachers, and teacher tools. So these are some of the tools that I didn't mention before, but I did mention what they do. So tutoring systems for students, they can go into Alex or Duolingo. Uh, for teacher tools, there's Carnegie Learning and also Duolingo. Um, and they help student performance. And all these are links that you'll be able to check out when you are on the uh, PowerPoint presentation. For adaptive learning platforms based on individual needs, there's Dreambox Learning, Smart Sparrow, Knuton, Smart and Sparrow, same for teachers and students, data and analytics, you can take a look at these. I'll be checking the and comparing them later on. AI-powered research tools. You're probably familiar with Zotero. Everybody familiar with that? Yes. And um, Semantic Scholar that I mentioned before that I use. And these are the teacher tools. They all have AI and chatbots and virtual assistants. I'm not sure that that would interest you, but if it does, uh, these are some, Replica is amazing. I don't know if you're familiar with that. And it's also available to students. Um, augmented reality, that's my field. Plagiarism detection. Uh, I'm sure you've had experience with them. Uh, for students, there's Qtex and Copyscape. Turn it in. I've heard a lot of uh, negative things about turn it in. Uh, lately, there have been problems with them because uh, it doesn't work. And copies, um, these don't really work. Uh, so it's better to get our students on board instead of trying to catch them because we won't be able to. Because of the generative nature of generative AI, it's creative. It just keeps doing different things all the time. There's no way to catch it. Uh, predictive analysis, I mentioned before, it's also available on LMSs such as Blackboard and Moodle, which is what I use. And then there's, uh, again, automated grading systems that you can use, language processing tools that I also mentioned before. So how does AI enhance? Well, like this. Is this, would you like this in the classroom? And then you won't have to be chatting with uh, generative AI. You'll just have one there right with you at all times, picking up all the information from the students. And, um, and you will be walking around um, asking the questions, maybe, uh, because I'm not sure that uh, generative AIs are good at asking questions. They can, of course, but I think our questions are probably much better and nobody will be able to take that away from us. 
uh, the human nature and our way of asking. So the teacher can ask and uh, the AI can process everything and find out what's going on. So working together, that's the idea, working together with an AI. So enhancement, I mentioned personalized learning, and these are links of tools that can be used to analyze student data, performance, and preferences. Very, very important because we all have preferences. So, so do students, right? And uh, these are examples of the tools. And then it recommends personalized content. You've got Newton again, same, but it's a bit uh, in detail here. Research enhancement and links of the tools and what they do, going to go a bit faster, and improved academic outcomes. Now, there is very little research. There is a bit of research on this, um, not much. Most of it is from the Far East for some reason. I have no idea why. I've gone through the research and uh, most of it is um, not even in Europe. When I say Far East, it's um, far, but they seem to be doing um, our work, maybe. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of research out there. You'll notice if you look for dates on uh, the AI tools that I've shared, you'll see that for 2023, it's mostly um, the research comes from the, from the Far East. Um, Claude little information about Claude. There's a QR code if you want to take that for Claude. Claude is nice. You can upload PDF files and text files, but they they can't be more than two. Um, I mean, they're, they can't be too heavy. And they don't, you can't use images, but PDF files, yes. And if you add too much information, if you're using 3.5, chat GPT 3.5, and you want more information than chat GPT, uh, 3.5 tells you that it's too much information. It can't process it. Go to Claude and it'll turn it into a PDF file and give you the information that you need. So I recommend chat GPT-4 because I don't see the point in using 3.5, even though, as I said, it's not that cheap. It's $20 a month right now. And you can't get an account. You can't subscribe. There are too many people right now and they don't know when you're on the waiting list. So imagine how popular it has become. Yes. Uh, my daughter's been trying to get on it and she can't. Uh, so I, I know that they're having issues right now. Um, how to use it. Uh, the features. Notice um, there's DALI and Bing that comes with it. And these are some examples. I'm going to go through these uh, quickly. Uh, there's some more on ChatGPT here. It's an open AI, which means that if uh, you're interested, you can create. And I have created some um, GPTs, they're called. But only those who have uh, ChatGPT4 can use them. They're great for research. And you can um, upload articles as well. There's Elicit. Now, Elicit is amazing. I'm talking about the free version. When I started with Elicit about a year ago, they only had the free version. It was in beta. Uh, now they have the, um, the paid version, but the free is amazing. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, you get very recent articles, which is what I'm after. I don't know. I think most of us are after uh, recent ones, at least five years. But when it comes to um, AI, it should be 2023 because that's when things started happening. And hopefully there'll be more research in 2024. Kineas is also amazing. I'm not sure which is better. Maybe you can try them both and decide which is better. I use both. Um, I like Kineas. It, um, it's not the same as Elicit, but it's very similar. And then there's, of course, again, Claude with the upload. Uh, Google Bard is also great for research. It'll offer you lots of um, information because it uses Google 
to get the information. And now that it has Gemini, it makes it even better. And it's going to get better. They're, they're promising that they're going to be better than Chad GPT 4 because 3.5 is really not that. It can analyze images. Uh, it you can't, it doesn't generate images, but it does analyze images, which is nice. Uh, of course, ChatGPT does both. It also accesses Google Maps, so you can get information from Google Maps, YouTube, if you're interested in uh, hotels or flights, things like that, which I'm not. Um, it might help you and your students if you're teaching, I don't know, something related to travel. It might be interesting for you and them to use Google Bards completely free, which is an advantage to chat GPT, unless you're paying for four. So you're, you might prefer Google Bard to anything else, even though it doesn't generate images. And then it also utilizes text to speech so you can speak your prompt. This is great for students, of course, but also for anyone who's too tired to write you can just, uh, if you're lying in bed, you know, just speak to it. You can use it on your phone, of course, uh, and um, it has that capability. It also converts text to audio in over 40 languages. Can you imagine? It's probably going to get better, uh, which is amazing. You can also hear academic articles uh, using Google Bard. And of course, there are now extensions. And I say this because if you go into Google Bard, you need to go to the top. This is fairly new. And you'll see the word extensions on Google Bard. And then you'll be able to decide which extension you want. And you might want them all. There's one for YouTube as well. And you can now generate summaries of videos, as I mentioned before. Translate captions. If you're watching a video in another language, it'll translate it for you and answer questions about video content. So if you have a question about a video, and most of our, that's what they do. Our students watch videos. I don't know if you watch videos, but that's what they do. We do too, of course, but they spend most of their time watching videos, whether it's on TikTok or I don't know, somewhere else, Instagram, but they're watching video. That's how they learn and they're learning all the time. So um, that's what it does. It summarizes videos. It also summarizes cute, key points of uh, scientific research if you ask for it. If you want a video on scientific research, you ask it uh, for a video, a YouTube video on that. So that's YouTube. It also has Google Drive uh, attached to it. So you can add Google Drive and uh, brainstorm, get your Google Drive, whatever you've added there and get information from that. It's not 100% yet with Google Drive. With YouTube, yes. With Google Drive, they're, I think they're still working on it. I, I tried it a few times and uh, it's not that great. And these are the ones that I mentioned before. There's Iris AI. These are all um, uh, research-based and they're really, really wonderful, all of them. And I'm thinking of the free version, okay? I, um, Semantic Scholar, I also mentioned, you can get that and read all about it. There is Sight that now has the paid version, Tableau, that you will love, I'm sure. Uh, if, you, if you're interested in creating visual data reports and analyzing data sets, Tableau is for that. Uh, and there's Power BL, it's a desktop. Google Data Studio, if you're into um, uh, data and you're interested in uh, capturing that, uh, it'll, be of interest here. There's Grammarly that I mentioned before and the AI, specifically Grammarly AI, not the old Grammarly that students might be using. And then there's again Quillbot. Those are both uh, Google extensions. And there's Twe, that's for language. If you're teaching English, uh, you might be interested in that. It helps create material content. It's based on videos and text. And of course, I mentioned transcriptor and how I use it. If you're interested in learning more about prompt engineering, uh, these are free, Learn Prompting and Lacara. And I highly recommend it. I, I remember at the beginning, I used to think, well, what do I need that for? I, I can write my own prompt. It must be for people who don't know anything. 
And <laughs> then I found out that that's not true. Uh, prompt learning to prompt um, is an art that uh, you can develop. So taking these courses will truly help and they're free. And it will save you time in the end because otherwise it's going to be trial and error, trying to get um, the generative bot to do what you want and give you what you want and you'll keep trying and it's a waste of time. So these prompt engineering free resources are really, really good. There's Free Code Camp, an open AI platform, which is uh, ChatGPT. They're all completely free. Some universities also have them. I don't know if your university is planning on having them, but uh, I think it's really important for everyone, for students and for faculty members. There's also Lambda. You must have heard of that test. And Ocnoob, if you're interested in those. And now, how do we do this? How do we integrate AI in higher education? What do we need to do? And I've got some suggestions on how to implement a, uh, an AI plan, whether for individual teachers or for the whole school. Uh, first step is to find out what you need. And I think this is a step that we really find hard because, you know, what do I need? I don't know what I need. You don't know what you need until you're there, until you encounter a problem. That, oh, that's what I need. So every time you encounter a problem and you say, oh, I need, write that down, jot it down somewhere so that you can collect your needs. And then you'll see uh, that AI can truly uh, provide you with uh, solutions to whatever your need is. There's always a solution to a need and AI tools can provide that. And then once you know your need, what do you need as a teacher in your classes, identify the gaps. Are there gaps? Whether it's the way you teach, the way students learn, what they learn. I mean, gaps could be so many, when you know that, I don't have to tell you, so many different things, but identify the gap and jot it down. And then description understand areas. You have to know something about AI, the ones that are available, and whether you can pay, you want to pay, or you want the free version, um, where the AI can come in and uh, fill that gap. And then, of course, uh, an example of this is personalized learning, which is my thing. Uh, I started with uh, technology in general because I wanted to reach my students, and I found that Technology, digital tools helped. And now with AI tools, it certainly helps a lot more. And then research AI tools. Research the ones that you found, the ones that I mentioned. Take a look at them. See, explore them and see if they can fill in that gap. And then identify the tools that meet your needs. And it could be AI tutors, grading software, AI-powered research tools that I mentioned. Try them out. And of course, the third step is everybody. Okay, the stakeholders. It's the students. It could be their parents. Parents are involved. Uh, it could be the community. The community cares. Uh, society cares. You know, whoever the care uh, and, and the teachers, of course. Involve the key parties, involve everybody. Don't be afraid. I mean, why not involve them and ask them, you know, what are your needs? Just to get an idea. And then description, engage with faculty. And that's your job to do it together. I mean, why do it alone when you can work together? And, and there's no fear. What is the fear? That th somebody might know more or that maybe I don't know enough, but nobody does. We're all learning anyways when it comes to AI. And AI is changing as I speak. You realize that, you know, Google is now doing things. So nobody's an expert. I don't know. And, and I can learn from you and you can learn from me and we can be learning together. So engage with faculty, staff and students and IT professionals. I mean, they know something too. And together, you'll know a lot more. And different ways of doing that, of course, is workshops, surveys, focus groups, uh, and then the infrastructure and evaluation. Assess the technical readiness. Is Are you ready as, as an individual a faculty member? Is the school ready? And then evaluate what you have 
and then find out what you need. Maybe you need some more. Identify what you need. And then you have to look at the internet, of course, bandwidth and hardware where capabilities, and then do a pilot. Test it out. Simple. Implement it in a small scale and try it out. Don't be afraid. Even in your classroom, it doesn't have to be the whole school. Uh, you're eager to start. So do the same thing as an individual. Test the tools. Have your student test it. See what they think. They'll love you for it, by the way. Uh, just the fact that you're, you're trying this out. I mean, that's what they want. They want us to do new things. And then trial runs and select courses. And then the training, of course, will come after that. The school will provide training. You will provide training for your students, for the other students. They can also help the other students. So you can get students helping students and peer learning and everybody helping everybody. So it's a win-win for everyone. And then offer training sessions for educators. If you know something, you know, help others, um, and then workshops and online courses and so on. And then full-scale implementation. That's when everybody's going to be using it and it's going to be campus-wide. And then continue with the assessments because things change all the time. So we need to assess and monitor and evaluate. And it's fun. It's doing something different. It's changing the way we teach. And uh, I'm sure we get bored. I know I got bored. Um, we get bored with what we do on a regular basis. So we do want changes and our students demand it. <laughs> if we don't do it, they're going to uh, ask for it. And then of course, we need to look at the policy and ethics. And this is really important. Establish guidelines. After we see how it's working, we'll learn whether it's going our way or not, or whether we need to add and establish guidelines. Of course, there's privacy policies, ethical usage, and so on. And then future planning. Plan something for the future after you know how things went. And there are many ethical considerations that we need to keep in mind. Of course, privacy, bias. And generative AI will tell you that they are biased. Ask them. They'll tell you, yes, I'm biased. And they are. Um, and transparency and accountability, intellectual property. That's a huge problem that we need to uh, share with our students. You know, our concerns are their concerns or they should be their concerns so we can bring them up. And of course, there's the digital divide. Can our students afford ChatGPT4? Or maybe just Google Bard because it's free. Um, and not work with ChatGPT 3.5 because it's free, because it's useless. And dependency on technology. We have to balance uh, how much we use and where is the balance. And ethical use of AI, long-term impact. We don't know what the long-term impact is. We should keep that in mind. So again, these are some of the challenges. I uh, have some references on them, the challenges and ethical considerations. I'm just gonna go through this uh, quickly. Data analysis, decision-making, innovation, collaboration, and so on. Bias detection, of course, um, that's very, very hard to detect. resource allocation, and AI detectors are not accurate. There's nothing out there. I, um, I worked with a company and they said, we will have the perfect AI detector. Nobody will be able to cheat, we'll detect it. I found so many bugs. They don't work. Copy links, uh, which is free, originality, AI, Zero GPT, writer, uh, none of them work. And there's an article there by Weber and Wolf, 2023. So my final words before we get into um, the references and a little more is that 
just like technology provides opportunities, AI provides opportunities. And I'm talking about generative AI, but it also poses challenges. And there are mitigation strategies. What we need to do, and this is really important, is the 2020. Have you heard of the 2020? Everybody's saying no? I mean, what I see, I don't know. Those that I don't see. Uh, the 2022 is being on the screen for 20 minutes, no more, and then looking away for 20 seconds at a distance. It has to be not close, but at a distance for 20 seconds. You can put it on your, uh, on your phone or on your watch. And then another 20 minutes, but no more than 20 minutes because there's something called an eye strain. And this eye strain is getting worse and worse. And it's very dangerous. I recommend this for you and your students, 2020 rule. These are some of the references. Notice um, the dates. I think that's really important these days when we talk about AI, generative AI, that it should be recent. So there are some, there is Darvishi. Uh, I don't know if you know George Siemens. He was one of the guys, the men that started the MOOC, the first MOOC uh, in the world in 2008. That was George Siemens. And he was in Canada then, now he's in the United States. He was also involved in this research study. And you can see by the names that it's not North American. Uh, most of the research studies, as I said, are from the Far East, uh, maybe Middle East and. And then there's another one, Baliu, uh, from Sydney, which is also at the other end. And um, these are some of the other ones, 2023 by Newman. And these are also 2023. Uh, there's again the presentation if you want it now before you go. Uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel and you can follow me on X or on LinkedIn.